Okay, let's get started now. And what I'd like to do is go around the horn and have everybody <coughs> introduce themselves and give two or three sentences about where you're from and uh, what your early involvement was, was with cable. Uh, George Gardner, can you start? Yes, I'm George Gardner. Uh, I connected my first customer uh, for cable television in December of 1951. Uh, that's a long time ago, but uh, I did leave the industry in 1999. Uh, Comcast operates the bulk of our systems that we were operating then, and I'm very happy to let them do that, and frankly, I think they're doing a good job. I live in Carlisle, Pennsylvania most of the year. I'm a Fort Lauderdale, Florida resident whenever it gets too cold in Pennsylvania. Bob. I'm Bob Tedek. Uh, I'm from State College, Pennsylvania. I got started in the industry in March of 1965 with Center Video, a spin-off of Secor, and uh, my partner and I, Everett Mundy, formed our own company, Telemedia Corporation, in 1970. I, uh, I spent about eight months of the year in Florida. I'm Bob Tarleton. I had the pleasure of installing about 35 or 40 cable systems dating back to about 1950 throughout the United States. I live in Lansford, Pennsylvania. I operated originally the Panther Valley television system, a cable system that serviced a number of communities I started in. Uh, that system we merged with Blue Ridge Cable and uh, I'm supposed to be retired, however, I'm on the go all the time, mostly in cable and other historical business. Hi, I'm Irene Gans. My husband and I ventured into cable television in 1954. We built our first cable system in Weatherly, Pennsylvania. We originated in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. We're still operating in cable. And this is my husband, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Gans. Irene mentioned that we did our, our joint uh, cable system 1954, but in 1950, in December of 50, we delivered our first picture on the Mo Mountain City uh, cable system, which was in Hazelton. And at the time, I was one of the chief engineers, I was the chief engineer, and we started out with three channels, and after a couple of hard knocks, we got into multi-channel service. Of the but uh, as I say, we had our first picture, the first customer in December of 1950. I'm Len Hecker. I started my first job in 1950, around March or April of that year for an outfit called Lycoming Television Corporation. I was their chief engineer. And we built a system in South Williamsport, included Montoursville, which is one of the communities close by. And I would like to tell this group here, and I've said this many times, if I knew then what I know today, I would never have got started. <laughs> I'm Strat Smith. Uh, my first introduction to uh, this industry, which in those days was known as the community antenna industry, was in 1948 when I was a staff attorney at the Federal Communications Commission. As time went on, I left the commission. I became into the, went into the practice of law, private practice. I became the first general counsel and executive secretary of the National Community Television Association. Uh, from then on, I had a career for 25 years practicing law where most of my clients were cable people. After that, I was honored with the, uh, uh, to be invited to take the uh, Cable Center Endowed Chair at Penn, Penn State University, Endowed Chair in Cable Television Studies, and I retired from that position in uh, April of this year. Tim? Uh, I'm Jim Duratz, and I was part of the Meadville cable system, and I'm the other half of the Barco Duratz family. And I suppose I could say I got started in cable because I married Helene. But it was a nice venture, and 
I'm very happy I did it. But uh, we're now, I'm now uh, involved with the Pennsylvania Cable Network, and I'm enjoying that very much. Hi, I'm um, John Rigas, and um, really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here with so many of my friends in the industry and grew up together. And I'm a chairman and CEO of Adelphia Communications. We're located in Cottesport, where our first system uh, was built in 19... 52 we started and hooked up our first customer in 53 and um, I just would like to say that um, my parents were Greek immigrants and we chose my brother and I were partners for many years and now I have three sons in the business and so we chose the word Adelphia which is the word for brothers and um, it's uh, served us well these many years. What I'd like to do now is just toss out a question and have anyone who wants to field it take it. And you ought to address your comments to each other and as well as you can ignore the fact that the cameras are here. And, and if one of you says something that the other one of you wants to comment on, just feel free to jump in and, and get the conversation going. What, I, what I'd like to um, ask you to think about is that this tape that we're doing here will go in the cable center and it could be that 20 years or 50 years or 100 years from now, someone will get out this tape or some form of it and put it in a machine and watch it. And for that person who has no idea that there was a time that there wasn't cable, what would you want them to know about how it got started? George, you want to start? The uh, <clears throat> cable industry got started because the television transmitters that the Federal Communications Commission had licensed to operate uh, would put a signal uh, in about 90% of the homes in the metropolitan area. Uh, but then as soon as you got out into the urban areas, I think their standards dropped down to 50% of the uh, homes would be able to receive television service. And when you got beyond the urban area, uh, they didn't predict any coverage. Uh, possibly Strat would like to help me a little bit with the FCC's rules back then, but the, the engineering rules, I think, were that it was a 90 and then a 50 or something like that. When you got beyond the coverage area uh, that was predicted for the television stations, uh, the people wanted television, but there were only certain areas where it was uh, able to uh, deliver a signal. One of those areas was the top of ridges, and that's why Bob, I believe, got started because he was in the television sales, um, the television receiver sales business. And if I recall, he could sell television sets on the ridge, but he couldn't sell them behind the ridge. So uh, his obvious uh, problem was, how do I sell there? And he devised a method to sell it. Well, in my case, uh, we built our, our first TV store up on 9th Street in, in Hazelton, which was on top of the mountain. And another thing, George, I guess you remember, uh, uh, Pennsylvania is a mountainous area. And what happened in Hazelton, the people on the top of the hill were getting good pictures, and we could sell TV sets to certain places, but down, those behind in, in the shadows and all couldn't get any pictures. So. Then, when my instructor, when I graduated of a GI school, told me about a guy named Bob Tartan, who had some kind of amplifiers and was bringing pictures in Lansford, and uh, they asked me would I join with him because I, I graduated from the school and go start building this cable company. Well, I figured, you know, what's a cable company? I didn't know nothing about it. And just by luck, I went to Lansford, or not Lansford, but Pottsville, where Marty Malarkey was a distributor for the local TV sets. And sure enough, I go in there, and the first thing he said, I had this darn cable that's broke down all the time, you know. But they were just installing the cable, and I took a look, and I said, how in the world, if you know Pottsville, that's way down in the hole. How in the world are you getting pictures here in Pottsville? 
And sure enough, he said at that time it was an RCA equipment, which didn't work too good. But then I understand the Gerald was pretty far along the way. And so immediately we went in, I joined up with the Hazelton Company and we put in the Gerald system. We started and we had problems, but uh, we got it working. And it's quite frankly, we got $125 for an installation and 375 a month. In, uh, which gave us some of the money to help build us up some, some more. And hookups at that time, phew, we had a waiting list. You couldn't hook them up fast enough that people wanted it. I, I think it's important if you're going to people to know 50 years from now why you had to have cable. Is that, uh, one of the most important things is that the television signal that was transmitted went in a straight line. Right. It didn't bend like a radio signal yeah. and didn't get down into the holes. Yeah. So but I think you've picture. forgotten the reason why <clears throat> cable really became necessary. That's right. It, the, the reason that cable became it. necessary, and I'll defer to Strat here, the FCC put a freeze on transmitting stations in 1948 for about 10 years, and therefore the organizations that built their cable systems in those, time, in those days didn't have to worry about competition from off-the-air signals. So that was a big boost as far as the cable industry. I believe it was 1948 when that uh, freeze was put on. Am I right about that, Strat? Yes, that's correct. The <coughs> FCC imposed the freeze in 1948 because it was experiencing a great deal of co-channel interference. And it realized that the television allocations plan just wasn't going to work. And so they uh, imposed this freeze, quote, for six months, close quote. And it was 1954, not 10 years, four years. Mm -hmm. It was 1954 when they finally uh, lifted the freeze. Well, in the meantime, both CATV and commercial television got off and running at the same time. Uh, there was at least one and probably several other systems that were operating as early as 1948 very small ones and very tiny ones, which was the year they imposed the freeze. So they had four years of uh, a period when s the metropolitan areas had a few stations and out in the hinterlands there were no stations. And uh, so there was a four-year period when uh, CATV uh, was able to get a good solid start. And then when uh, the freeze was lifted and they began to build stations again, it took a number of years to get them spread out throughout the entire country. And so the, the need <coughs> for community antenna reception uh, persisted for several years afterward. And that was the climate that en enabled the industry to get off to uh, a good running start. Well, I'd like to just jump in there and add to that, Strat. The, uh, the freeze was lifted, but the um, solution was defective. Uh, the freeze was lifted and uh, UHF assignments were made. Uh, Harrisburg received four UHF assignments and uh, the UHF was so poor that it did not get beyond the local area. So the cable television systems were able to provide the signals from more distant stations. But the uh, freeze being lifted uh, merely gave everyone the idea that the uh, problem had been solved when actually just another problem had been created. Well, up in Hazelton now, is when they lifted the freeze, and we got UHF stations, you remember Channel 28 and 16, and they did not come into Hazelton any better than the Philadelphia stations, because UHF, as you mentioned, as bad as it is for the V, which just strictly line of sight, it's even tougher on the UHF, because that doesn't fit into the holes. So when they came on the air, they didn't bother us hardly at all. But you also must remember that television sets in those days were unable to receive UHF. Yeah. So in order to have UHF, you had to have a top of the set box. Mm -hmm. Converter. So in 1962, the FCC gave Gerald a contract to do a survey in New York City with regards to the feasibility of UHF versus VHF. And fortunately, I got to be the project engineer on that job. I spent a year in New York City. We built a station in the Empire State Building, 
on Channel 31, which, by the way, is still there and is used by the city of New York as WNYC. We also put a station on top of the, Empire, the uh, George Washington Bridge, <coughs> Channel 77, which never worked, Bertha Darn, so we didn't bother with that. But we did 5,000 locations, 2,500 in Manhattan and 2,500 within 25 miles of, of the Empire State Building. And in those 5,000 homes, we would do a test as to how good the UHF channels were, and we campaigned, compared them to Channel 4, which I believe is NBC out of New York, and Channel 7, which is ABC out of New York. And we did reasonably well, and in fact, I had 100 black and white television sets and 10 colored sets made by RCA, which we used as the purpose of that test. And based on the work which we did in New York City in 1962, I believe it was 1965, and by the way, the, the uh, mentor for that particular system was Robert E. Lee, who was a commissioner of the FCC. And by the way, <coughs> his name doesn't come from Robert E. Lee, the general, but rather from Rem uh, Robert Emmett Lee, who was an Irishman. But anyway, based on the survey which we did in 1965, I believe that's the year, the FCC mandated that all television sets would have to be all channel receivers. So that took away the top of the set box. I'm, I, I'm compelled to um, uh, address the question. Ryan men mentioned, mentioned a question. Um, uh, insofar as um, the early days, uh, everybody, I say everybody, but uh, anybody affiliated with the possibilities of television uh, wanted to get television down in these primarily isolated areas. And uh, I'm now addressing myself by uh, uh, some comments. My name, my, my name was mentioned. And um, uh, not only me, but other television desirable persons, both reception and dealers of television sets, uh, would um, uh, install antennas, they had an antenna and they'd reach up the mountain to try to get television reception. And I can attest to it. I also installed uh, antennas up the side of the mountain to try to sell these television sets. A number of television dealers and servicemen were doing the same thing. And we were using, uh, the only thing that we knew at the time was twin lead, the old antenna twin lead, uh, which was an open wire. Also, the uh, uh, out in the western part of the country, uh, they were open using open wire, really open wire, um, to uh, extend the television from an area that could be received down into an area that desired it. And we also were doing the same thing. I forgive me for entering and saying I give my father credit. My father was also a radio and television serviceman. I, I've been in the radio business since 1925. I built my first crystal set then and stayed in the electronic business all the time. And uh, uh, trying to um, uh, improve reception, I said to my dad, we can sell sets down in here, we'll do the same thing. Uh, run this twin lead around the place. No, 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 Bob, he said. Uh, that won't work. He said uh, he had vision enough to see that uh, that was a hedge and they would have television, but they couldn't guarantee it. And I knew that to be so because uh, the few that I did use and another serviceman did, they were either being cut by someone or by an animal or chewed at or, or when it would rain, they didn't have reception. And as a result, uh, there was uh, very d distressed customers. My, father would say, we can't afford to give me people money back. This is no way to sell television. You sell what you can off of antennas off the roofs. Don't try to extend it. Well, little did I, didn't listen to him, I started experimenting with this antenna. But the point I wanted to make was, um, I, I, do, I do some public speaking primarily to children, and their question was, goes away back. Well, didn't you have any radio in those days, been 25? And I said, no, I had my first radio, which I built. So I owned it addressed 50 years from now, 
people who say, well, wasn't this always here? No, it wasn't always here. You know, and uh, the, I'll sum it up by saying, what got me started was experimenting with coaxial cable, which was impervious to destruction, impervious to um, interference, uh, supposedly, uh, and um, that uh, that was the beginning of um, cable. Thing. Let me um, <coughs> reflect from my perspective. Um, in the early days, uh, one thing that I find very interesting, um, uh, when I was first introduced to um, the prospect of uh, bringing uh, TV signals to a cotter sport, I had this big fear that, yeah, there was a freeze going on that we talked about, and that UHF stations were going to proliferate and VHF stations were going to come closer to um, rural America. And what I um, find interesting is here we are 50 years later that if you live in Cottersport, Pennsylvania, uh, and you live in 80% of our community, that you still can't receive a VHF signal or a UHF signal. Uh, and all these fears and thoughts that stations were going to happen in certain parts of America, it still hasn't happened. Irene, is there a story that you would like to know that someone 50 years from now would hear and, and get an idea of what you went through? I have a lot of stories. <laughs> <coughs> well, they, they could picture it. They're probably saying, wasn't TV always here? No, it wasn't, but um, it's something that you wouldn't really, I don't know how to put it, something you wouldn't think about to look at a, a glass thing and all of a sudden see pictures of movie stars right in your own room. Uh, my father was a favorite, his, Jack Ben Benny was his favorite, so one night I found out that Jack Benny was going to be on, on TV. I called my dad and my mom, I said, come on up to the house, I have a surprise for you. Well, my father expected a present. He didn't know what it was going to be. Well, I turned on that TV, and he saw Jack Benny in person, right on television. He was amazed, amazed, thoroughly amazed. And I, I like, I like, I love, I love, I love, I love Lucy. I mean, that's one of my favorites. So, all right. That television brings everything good into people's lives, you know, happiness and education and we we gone beyond that. We have games on TV now, and it's going forward faster than you can imagine. You know, one of the problems we had in those early days is, in, in, like I'd say, 1950, 51, especially, well, 50 when we started, was getting people to, uh, to believe that the cable could work. And fortunately enough, we had uh, the Coriel family, which was wealthy in, in the, the coal business up there, and the one night was up, and like I say, I lived on top of the hill, and I was able to get the, oh, the New York, New York, New York and Philadelphia stations, and there was a fight that night. And so, and he, oh, incidentally, before that, he tried the local radio uh, owner, the radio station owner, the Vic Deem, to get it financing. T the Tito family, which was big in television, tried to get financing from then, and they, they, they had no faith that it. It, it'll never work. So anyhow, I invited the Coriels up to my house and had the TV set there and it was a fight that night. He figured, holy, he said, how do you do that? I said, well, I got a, at that time, I guess about a 35, 40 foot tower on top of the house and I was able to get the pictures. <laughs> and then that's when Tris Lucian talked to him. He said, well, why don't we do like Lansford is doing? They're running a coaxial wire down the mountain. They have, uh, and he mentioned Gerald amplifiers at the time and they have pictures in Lansford, and that's really in a, down behind the mountains. Till today, there's no, no signals down there. And sure enough, they invested the money, and believe it or not, we got our first picture in Hazelton. And again, at, they put up the financing. First, we made them believers that there is cable and so forth. Then, as we got the picture into town, it was, all you had to do was put the TV sets in the window, and, People were signing up as fast as we can get, put them in. Yeah. Uh, Bob Tudek, can you start a conversation on what kind of obstacles you had to overcome? I and mean, if you think about it, technical, regulatory fights with um, t 
telephone companies or broadcasters? What, do, what springs to mind is the kind of hurdles you had to get over? Well, first off, I'm, I'm the real rookie here. <laughs> <laughs> I started in 65. My partner started in 56. But these guys got started in 48, 50, 51. But they're all, they've been talking about electronically deprived areas. But you see, uh, when I got into business in 65, uh, that was true, even then. And there was no cable in the metropolitan areas of the country. There was nothing in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Miami, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, St. Louis, Phoenix, Houston, Dallas. All of those were built far later. And I think they were just starting something in teleprompter Manhattan in 65 and 66. And they were doing something in San Francisco and perhaps San Jose and maybe somewhere else. I don't know. But I convinced our board of directors three weeks after I started to let me try and get a franchise in Glassport, Pennsylvania, which was in the metropolitan market of, of Pittsburgh. And I, I competed against KDKA and Westinghouse, who were already in the business. People don't know that, but they had 35,000 subscribers in 1965 in Georgia. They were in <coughs> Del Costa, Georgia. And I not only beat them 18 contests in a row, but got 33 in a row against just about everybody, including Time Life, who were in the business. And I beat them in Penn Hills. And I got 69 franchises out of 75 contests in the, and my contribution is not the rural and electronically deprived areas, but bringing cable to the metropolitan areas. I think to this day, there are more higher penetration of cable TV subscribers in Pittsburgh area than there are in any of the top 25 markets in the country. And a matter of fact, there's one system today, or will be when it's finished, AT&T has a system with approximately 400,000 subscribers on one master antenna. And the thing that I'm proud of is that when I was getting these franchises, I gave them all the blue sky, all the things that are happening today. But I told them it was blue sky. And I predicted that one day there would be one system and it would, they would be doing the things they're doing today. But I told them that was a long way off. And it's come to pass. In response to the question that you asked, I'm sure everybody around this table will remember that in the very beginning, the telephone company wouldn't permit you on their poles at all. If you were going to use a pole system, it had to be a power system because <coughs> Bell was no way going to let you on their telephone poles. But in addition to that, you mentioned the fact that there was a fight with the broadcasters because the broadcasters used the cable industry as an outfit that was stealing their signals and paying them. And that's where the word community cable television came from because we really didn't supply television pictures, what we did was remote the individual's antenna. And that's how cable got its original name, was basically on that premise. So yes, there were a lot of legal fights in the very beginning, fights with telephone and fights with the broadcasters as well. 1966, AT&T informed all of their subsidiaries not to grant any further pull attachment agreements. Uh, maybe people remember this because they were going to redo their agreement. <coughs> so there was a period of one or two years where you could not get an agreement from any of the Bell companies. And at that time, some of the independent companies refused the deal. And there were people who were putting up their own poles, putting cable on trees and fences. I remember one guy coming to me in, in a little town called Howard. He couldn't get a pull attachment agreement from an independent telephone company. And I, I had the presence of mind to tell him, go check to see their franchise. These franchises that the phone companies have are usually for 50 years or very long. So happens their the franchise was about to expire or had expired for the phone. They hadn't known it. When he called it to their attention, he had no problem getting on the getting on the poles. Uh, but uh, really, that was the biggest job for from 1965 to about 1968 or 69, getting on the poles, especially in the metropolitan and urban areas, where they, the power companies, if you recall, 
in Pennsylvania were fighting with the phone companies about who should handle the space on the poles. Uh, the power companies actually owned most of the poles, but the phone companies believed that they had the right to rent the communication space. So then there was, again, a fight between the two of them, and there was a holdup because of that. On uh, that subject, you might find interesting, I just related, just this very day, um, a story about uh, AT&T. Uh, I wanted to get on AT&T, I didn't know it was an AT&T pole. I was operating in an area that was a private telephone company, operated really by the coal company in the area, but some of the executives had built this carbon telephone company. Uh, it serviced the Panther Valley, Lansford, Summit Hill, Coal Hill, Nesco, and the whole area. And um, I must give credit to some of those people. They, it was easy to get cooperation with, as an example, this is one of the examples, with the telephone company, because I told them my idea. I, what I want to do is build a system, cable. Geez, that'd be great. They gave, what, what can we do to help you? <laughs> they were inviting me because they wanted television. The same thing happened, that's how I, uh, my attorney got so interested. He lived in Summit Hill. I had sold him a television set, was building a home in Lansford, and said, Bob, what, you got, what am I gonna do for television? I said, I'm getting this idea. Hey, I'll, I'll give you all the help I can. I said, lots of help. Going back on this one, I wanted to get on a few poles, and I thought it was, I, we always call them the telephone poles, but it happened to be an AT&T long, long line that came in from somewhere and down into Lansford. So uh, what happened was uh, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, local boys, the uh, telephone president said, uh, we've got a contact for you to get permission on those, we've got to contact AT&T. I said, what, why, why them? I didn't know, because they have jurisdiction over those poles. So as a result, uh, they set up a meeting. And uh, I already had made the attachments because my early days with the power company, I had cooperation with the vice president of pole attachments who happened to have been a friend of Marty Malarkey's and he heard about what I was doing. He came over to see it and he ran back and told Marty Malarkey, hey, that's what you can do in Lansford. And he told me, make attachments to the polls. Give me the poll numbers and I'll get on. So he was cooperative. They were anxious at that time, it was 1950, to get loading, power loading. So they, and they used to sell television, things like that. So at the same time, I had cooperation from the power company, made these attachments and later on made the poll agreements. But uh, with, the, with the phone company, they said, you go ahead on the polls, but you're gonna have to go below us. You can't go above. Everything was below. That was the early days where our, some of the system that I had built there was below. Well, that created more problems to get clearance spaces, but, it, but that's, what, that's what they said. And they said, we've been in touch with AT&T uh, to ask if there's any foreign attachment uh, specs that you might have. And they said, we don't know what they're doing, but we better come up and look and see. And they did. I entertained the vice president of, I always call him, pole attachment for AT&T. Came up from Wall Street office and he brought along three or four other engineers. Spent a day up there looking and see what I was doing. And they said, well, there's one thing. Uh, uh, I think you're, you're doing all right. I see you're doing good pole construction. I also employed coal pole line people who knew what they were doing. They worked for the coal company and, I, and they did it on their off time. So we didn't do a sloppy operation. And, and, and incidentally, the, the uh, phone company helped me to the extent I said, I'm gonna have to suspend this on messenger. And he said, we're using a cable lasher. Let's try it. And it wouldn't work. And they went to the trouble of uh, of their of spinner getting revamped a bit to use the coax cable and use the lash of the wire I was using. So I gave, I gave them 
a lot of credit. I had a lot of help, uh, professional, good quality help. And uh, whenever AT&T came up, they said, oh, the construction is good. I see this, this fellow uh, mean business. He, and uh, I got talking to him when he was about ready to leave. Uh, he said, well, we're going to drop specs for foreign, atta foreign attachments other than telephone. But he said, uh, one thing, um, we'll have, you'll have to keep above all telephone as far as we're concerned. And uh, I said, uh, casually, I just said, you know, that's something I, I, I'm amazed why uh, AT&T, you've got all your facilities and all your engineering and all of your development. Why they wouldn't think of something like this? He said, oh, this is nothing. This is only a hedge. He said, in a couple of years, you won't need this. You'll be tearing it down off the poles. I never copied his name. I never r recorded it. I wish I had it today. <laughs> I was going to say, you were talking about problems in the early days. One thing was getting on the poles was a problem. <laughs> but the antennas and stuff were usually up on a mountain somewhere, and there's no power there. So we, in my case, what we did is attach the power line. We put our own power line going up. We had it attached to trees, and you can see the problems we had there. And then uh, come the bad weather, stuff like that, the wires were knocked down. But uh, that, there were some of the headaches. And well, I guess it took us, what, about four or five years to have a power company run the poles up to yeah. Berwick. But there were some of the headaches as well as the right-of-ways. And Bobby, you're saying they made you go below the telephone line? Or did they change the spec to go above it? No. We started out, the local telephone company said you can't get above us or power company. You must be below us. Mm -hmm. So we put our installations in. Quite a few, quite a few potential subscribers just below until finally AT&T had come in. We were waiting for them to come in to set specs. And they set the specs for the local telephone company. Local telephone company always looked to Bell uh, or AT&T for their specs and they followed them. And it was them that designed, oh. they above them, they had the specs and then that's when we had a formal agreement. Then also, the local telephone company gave us a formal agreement. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Bob LaRue asked for one once, and uh, I sent Bob LaRue, that was one of the NCTA attorneys, yeah, God, he's, he's gone from us now, but Bob LaRue sent back a flowing letter. Bob, this is the best contract I've ever seen. <laughs> but it was one that I helped develop uh, for the phone company. It was with the phone company. Did, did the rest of you have good relations with the phone company or the power company <clears throat> like Bob did, or were there problems? Well, I think they're forgetting not only did AT&T refuse to give out an agreement, but they decided to get into the business. <clears throat> and this is when they started lease specs throughout the whole country. And I guess somebody, Mr. Barco in the Pennsylvania Association, defeated their attempts here in Pennsylvania. And then they also lost in various other states. Am I right, Sir. Strat? Yeah. They lost leaseback <coughs> capabilities in Ohio and Michigan and, and what have you. And they abandoned their plans of leasebacks throughout the country. So that's what held things up in a great many areas. Uh, and there were lease belts back built in Pennsylvania, not too many, but there were some. But there were quite a few built in the state of Ohio. Could you explain a lease back? No. Excuse me. Uh, if I may, I was yeah. going to respond to, to your question because Bob's story is, uh, is very interesting. And in my experience, and not as an operator, but as an attorney who worked with these people and listened to their complaints and so on, Bob's uh, cooperative experience with AT&T and the telephone companies was by far the exception in the industry. Absolutely. By and large, uh, AT&T around the country was simply resisting in every possible way, allowing uh, uh, CATV to get on the polls. Finally, they, they simply had to do it as a result of public pressure in the individual communities. But even then, they dragged their feet with the excessive make-ready costs. You, you men around this table know far better than I do uh, how difficult uh, that problem was. And uh, uh, I've often been asked the question, 
well, why didn't AT&T get in and provide this service themselves? And uh, there were really two answers to it. Uh, the first was that this was the end of World War II, and they had a telephone backlog mm -hmm. that took them 10 years to catch <coughs> up with, and they simply could not address, uh, assign their resources to that. Uh, the other reason was, like uh, an awful lot of people, maybe including some of us around this table, they didn't think the industry was going to last. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they didn't want to uh, invest their uh, resources in it. But uh, again, I will repeat, uh, Bob's experience, to the best of my knowledge, is an exception. Uh, and uh, uh, he was very fortunate. May I just um, punctuate that by saying, this was back in early 50, and by 1951, late 51 and 52, the uh, telephone companies they immediately became antagonists. Not the power companies, the power companies were cooperative because they were glad for the load, additional load. But the telephone companies were giving, and whenever I went with Gerald, that was half of our problems, trying to get it, particularly up in New England, uh, they just refused, wouldn't get in, at the at, at things. But what I was speaking of was the very early few days or few months and that was my experiences. Strat, wasn't which, it true that the uh, <clears throat> AT&T could not get it into the business directly because of the antitrust case <clears throat> that they lost? Well, that was a number of years later. That's right. Uh, I'm just addressing the the time, the immediate early history of the industry. Yeah, I yes, there was a time came when AT&T agreed not to get into any business for which they didn't <clears throat> have uh, uh, public utility tariffs on file with appropriate regulatory commissions, but, but that was later on. Yeah, but but they did try to get at leasebacks, and the leaseback he asked the question was they would build and own the cable system and lease them to an operator. Hmm. Well, and, that and, is true, but they got out of the leaseback business also after they agreed not to uh, provide any service that wasn't a public utility communication <coughs> service. Well, let's talk about that leaseback business just a little bit more uh, from the cable operator's standpoint because I was involved in a leaseback. Uh, I was attempting to get a franchise in Newburgh, New York, and I was sitting in the uh, New York telephone zone manager's office, and he was on the telephone uh, in the middle of our agreement. We worked through the agreement that they had, the attachment agreement, and then he got an urgent phone call, and when he came back, the agreement was not on the table anymore. So I presume that was in 1965, exactly uh, when Bob's talking about it. But uh, since we couldn't uh, get a pole attachment agreement, we did accept the leaseback, and that leaseback was outrageous. Uh, it was so expensive, it was unbelievable, and they had to make all the connections into the home, and they did all the maintenance on it. And if you had a service call, and you went to the home, and the obvious problem was with the telephone company system, uh, if it was before eight o'clock in the evening, they would respond on double overtime or whatever their rate was. I've forgotten what they called it, but it was outrageous. And if it was after 8 o'clock in the evening, they would come out the next morning. So it was obviously very antagonistic uh, to uh, the customer. Uh, the cable operator had a terrible problem explaining to the customer, yeah, we'll be back tomorrow and that type of thing. But uh, aside from the leaseback, I'd like to just go back to something else that Bob Tudak touched on there when he was uh, building in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, John Regas and I built a system in Uniontown, and we had a unique situation there. Possibly you can help me with this a little bit, John, if I forget some of the details. Uh, and, and I also want to mention one of the details about the equipment, so uh, when I get through with this, I'll mention that. Uh, we had uh, very good cooperation from the television stations in Pittsburgh, believe it or not, because 
they found that they had to operate translators. Pittsburgh is a very difficult town to get any sort of television off the air in, or was at that time, because it's just a bunch of valleys. And so the uh, television stations had built the translator system which ringed Pittsburgh. And they found that it didn't work much better than the off the air signal that they provided and gave them all kinds of problems and extra costs. So they encouraged us to build that system in Uniontown because then it could uh, take their translator off the air, but they wouldn't take the translator off the air till we were able to supply the service. Remember that, John? I sure do. And I think uh, they were encouraging the other operators to get rid uh, of the translators uh, in the same way. So that probably helped you and Jim Palmer out there and some of the franchises around Pittsburgh. In addition to that, one of the unique things about the Uniontown system was it was built with a Starline 1 that Gerald had come out with. And <laughs> Len is smiling down there because he remembers, I think, Starline 1, we put the, the amplifiers on the bench and did somewhere around six or eight modifications to the amplifier before we'd even put it out in the housing. And I can recall John and I had a terrible problem uh, with the, the SLE, the line extender. Uh, we put them up in the summertime, and as soon as it started to get cold in the winter, why the trans the uh, line extenders all stopped working. They had a big capacitor that didn't work right, and so most of the town blotted out where the extenders were, and it was a little bit of a frantic situation to try to figure out how to put a capacitor onto those line extenders because nothing would fit in the case, so we put spaghetti tubing on the leads that went into the amplifier and stuck it outside and I imagine we radiated a little bit of signal that that was before the FCC started to even look at radiation but we did a little bit of non-ionic uh, radiation there but uh, talking about the business of the television stations or the networks not cooperating with the cable systems CBS was the main group that that CBS network that really didn't like cable operators. If you would request permission to carry a CBS signal, the television station that move. carried the CBS network was required by CBS, I suppose, to write and say, we are not authorized to allow you to use our signals. But strangely enough, in Scranton, the CBS outlet WDAU was very interested in getting on all the cable systems. And we did a lot of work with them putting up uh, equipment at the various cable systems so that we could translate their signal and actually get it so that it would <coughs> run on the cable system. So it was uh, <coughs> not all of the networks were against cable and certainly not all the television stations were against cable. Most of them were very appreciative, especially in the UHF regions of Pennsylvania to get the extra coverage that the cable system provided. May, may I say that also, uh, the reference to WDAU reminds me that WDAU wanted to get on our system, and I kept saying, there's the problem we had, it has limited channel capacity. I said, you've got to make it attractive enough for us to make some changes, because we, we had one or two New York channels on there. As a result, uh, they say, well, what do we do? I said, well, I suggest you go on later at night. They were, had a daytime and up until about 11, 11, 12 o'clock at night, and they'd go off. Make it attractive enough. I'm not one to take credit for it, but I suggested to them to do this and uh, run all night if necessary. Run. And they did. And that was their success. They also would call me and say, Bob, that was a good idea. We're now getting better cooperation because people are late at night and want to see television. The other stations don't have, they go off the air. We're on all night. And that WDAU was progressive in that, in that respect. Yeah. Most of the stations signed <coughs> off around 1.30. Uh, they would have a late night news <coughs> around 11 then go into a Today Show, and when a Today Show went off the air, why, they signed off. Well, unlike most of the people around this table, 
I'm not an operator and have never been an operator. I'm basically an engineer. And one of the problems that I remember in the early days, and uh, the early days for me were all construction, was the fact that most of the communities, many of the power companies and telephone companies went down through easements. And they had a franchise which, which permitted them to put cable down the easement. But the people who lived in those homes didn't think the cable operator had a right to go down those easements. And I recall in the early days being held up in construction because somebody said, you can't cross my property line. And I learned later on that the reason why we couldn't pass his property line was because he wanted television, but he didn't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of those. <laughs> they all tried it. <laughs> in addition to the problem on the polls, about the time I got in the business is when the FCC took over the jurisdiction of cable TV. You might want to talk about that or some of you. You remember when the FCC decided to take us over? They had a big battle. I think the head of the committee in the Senate was Orrin Harris. Well, it, uh, it was a big battle and it lasted for several years. And uh, the uh, FCC at least twice before they uh, uh, decided to undertake uh, jurisdiction had ruled that they didn't have any. And the thing that uh, got the, uh, finally brought the industry under their control was the availability of microwave for CATV. When we got the first microwave grants uh, uh, to uh, permit carrying signals to uh, CATV systems, uh, we thought that uh, this was one of the one of the big events, and today it still is. It still, historically, was one of the big developments in the industry. But at the same time, it was a development that allowed the industry to begin to encroach into broadcast areas that formerly uh, uh, had a monopoly. And uh, the uh, broadcasters had the political strength, first to in interest uh, Congress in uh, uh, the Senate Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee to conduct hearings on the impact of cable and illegal boosters on the orderly development of broadcasting. And uh, the FCC finally succumbed to the pressure uh, of the Congress and decided they would impose uh, uh, regulation on any <coughs> CATV system that used microwave because they figured uh, uh, we, we can tell the CATV system, uh, you must give non-duplication protection for a period 30 days before till 30 days after the local broadcaster would broadcast. And uh, uh, we'll take, we either won't grant the license or we'll take it away from you if we've all, already got one. And they started out with that and then gradually over the years uh, got to the point where they just said, we're gonna apply these rules to all cable systems, whether or not <coughs> they use microwave. That took a period of seven or eight years to get from the first one to the last one, but finally they just reached out and, and grabbed without a scintilla of authority in the Communications Act to regulate the industry. Uh, they just uh, took jurisdiction and said the reason we're doing this is because CATV systems don't pay copyright fees and therefore they're in unfair competition with local broadcast stations and we've got to protect the local broadcast stations. And you all know that went on for years. Strat, I'd like to just touch on something. Uh, while uh, you were talking about that, it reminded me that uh, almost every fight that the cable industry had on Capitol Hill back in those days uh, seemed to have a large group of people writing to their congressmen. And I seem to recall that uh, I was told one time that most of those letters were coming from retirees from the telephone industry. And the telephone industry <coughs> had some way of manipulating their letter writing and in fact assisted them in writing letters to a lot of key congressmen so that the telephone industry got their way a lot of times. Can you address that? Do you recall anything about that? 
well, I can address it. I don't want to get too far away from the subject, but the fact of the matter is, by the 1920s, the <coughs> late 1920s, AT&T owned the major telephone company in every single state in the union. And they controlled, owned 80% of the telephones and controlled almost 100% of them through their control over long distance service and so on. And uh, uh, as a uh, uh, result of this, uh, uh, they, they simply, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> apologize for that. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, they were able to uh, completely dominate the industry. Well, in, ad in addition uh, to, to that problem, uh, excuse me, we had the problem of, of the copyright suit where we couldn't get uh, bonds and we couldn't get insurance because we were facing uh, multi-million dollar in we were Nader uh, they, who, who was the lawyer Nader who was the, the lawyer that they had represented all the copyright owners yeah uh, Louis Neiser Nader. Louis Neiser I know it started with an N and uh, when I, we went to get bonds uh, we couldn't get bonds unless you went to Lloyd's of London because we were facing all these uh, claims and you played a role there uh, in that lawsuit where we we won that suit before the Supreme Court and that enabled us to get get rid of the liabilities of the of the copyright potential liabilities of the copyrights. Well, I was involved in that litigation, and I didn't complete my answer okay. to uh, George's question. I had a senior moment while I was coughing and forgot what it was I was trying to say. <laughs> but uh, the the control, their ability to. Uh, uh, dominate through mailings resulted from the fact that in every community uh, around the country, the local telephone manager attended every meeting of the local chamber of commerce and every meeting of the local municipalities and kept track of everything that was going on. <coughs> and uh, they also were required to be acquainted with the local congressman, the local representative, and the local state officials. This was a system requirement within the entire Bell organization. And so the result was that whenever AT&T in New York says right, they wrote. And they knew who to write to. They wrote to the people who uh, passed the legislation. Can I change gears a little bit here and ask each of you to, to take a turn in looking back to the day you flipped the switch on your first cable system and the first pictures went to people's houses, what the atmosphere was like in town, what you heard from people in town, how the newspaper reported it, what the customers said. Can you, John, can you start? Well, I think that, um, you know, um, it's hard to, um, to find the words uh, that uh, when you brought that signal down to that first home and you saw that picture light up, uh, the excitement that the customer had to think <coughs> this was a miracle. They were sitting in their living room and receiving a picture in this little rural community of, of uh, Cottesport. And um, my reflection is that along with that was the excitement that and the satisfaction that it gave me <coughs> be part of that, to bring that picture to somebody's home and to provide a service that would in the future years bring so much enjoyment and satisfaction. So um, there was a great feeling of excitement and um, it covered, it was covered in a local newspaper, it was front page news, photographer was there interviewing everybody and there was a sense of really uh, something important happening in this little community but on the other hand i think also that sometime we you know we've been focusing a lot on 
before I let everybody talk, but we've been focusing a lot on all of our problems, and there were a lot of problems. But I just wanted to um, comment that, um, you know, uh, all of us had to improvise, and all of us had to come up with different ways to keep the system going and alive. And I was thinking about my, I've repeated this story, but I don't want to hear a story from Joe and George about this, and then I want to hear a story from Jim, because I think that it was a fun time too. Yeah, we lost a lot of sleep, and yeah, we, uh, we had a lot of concerns and anxieties. But let me tell you, I wouldn't change it for anything. I was so fortunate to be it there and be part of all this. So, and I'm thinking about when we built our second cable system in my hometown in 1954, and my brother and I, and we had the Gerald engineers, and um, we went up and we were offering five channels, and uh, that was the state of the art. And the picture looked good, and but at the bottom of the hill, my parents lived, and we checked it out. Picture looked great, and we were ready to go, and we were going to give it to the customers. That night, I got a call from my brother, and I said, "What's the matter?" He says, "Well, the picture's just gone to all the snow." He says, "I don't know what the matter is," <laughs> and we just every night. Gus would call me up and say, the picture's bad. Daytime, it looks good. And we called up the Gerald engineers, Frank Martin. I don't know if many was part of it. We all checked it out. We did everything possible. After about 15 days, I got a call from my brother. And my brother said, well, he says, uh, John, he says, got it all figured out. I said, well, you do. The picture's good. He says, great. He says, I said, what happened? He says, well, Mom used to turn on the front porch light at 7 o'clock every night. And it shorted out everything. So <laughs> it was as simple as that. And that's how bright we were. <laughs> now I'd like to hear a story about Joe, if I can, and the shotgun. Yeah. Talk, talk about that's problems. We were. You know, and like I said, Hazelton was, was a Yankee town. <laughs> and we put up a, a stack of antennas, actually 64 antennas, in... Sure enough, in the springtime, the ball games are just starting. They're into practice and this and that. And the people are watching the games. Everybody's happy. And this time, we're at, we're at a different antenna site than the original. And pictures were pretty good. So come springtime, we get a good rainstorm. And sure enough, the darn thing's all iced up. The, the tower iced up the, the wires and everything. And me and Charlie Gicking are sitting up there. How in the world are we going to get these pictures back? So we got the brainstorm, and nobody wanted to climb it. They were up about 50, 60 feet. So we, well, we'll try, maybe with a shotgun, we can clean, knock the ice off. <coughs> and some of you heard the story, but it's the truth. So we get a number six shot, shoot at it a couple times, nothing, the ice just stayed there. I said, well, let's try a number four shot. Maybe that'll do it. <laughs> we shot the number four, and still the ice didn't come down. So I'm trying, well, maybe maybe a number two will definitely do it. So we're shooting half a box of shells, and the thing never did ice up. And Oh, incidentally, now when you, when you ice up, you retain the picture, but you lose the sound. You change, change the characteristic, and you lose the sound. So then we got the bright idea, let's try some buckshot. That's, if that don't do it, nothing will. So the first round, me and Charlie both shot together. How we blew the antennas away. <laughs> so, not only did they have no sound, they lost the picture too. <laughs> May I address that? Uh, as a matter of fact, the question did arise. Um, I had the first public display was in, in town uh, in a storeroom. They set up a television set and it made an announcement if you want to see television, go downtown. And uh, I have just located some photographs. As a matter of fact, I'm doing <laughs> research for the history of Carbon County. I, they call on me because of my age. Bob, Bob Tarleton know all about this, so <laughs> they go back to Bob Tarleton. And uh, I got involved a year and a half ago with the historical group from Carbon County. They have had four editions starting 
10 years ago uh, of the county and they gradually moved up and now they're in our section and they're doing some work and they saw me about a year and a half ago and they wrote something. We have something in there about you. And as we were discussing it, they started to discuss some other things about department store in town. And a photograph of me was in this in this recently. And uh, they said, there's a, two Tarletons in there. And I'll, I, I didn't mean to inject this, but, it, but it, it's, it's interesting. And uh, they said, are you any relation? And I said, if it's a photograph I knew, it's Bright's department store. And I'm on there. You are? No, it was in 19, uh, uh, 1928. I said I was in high school and worked there, and my father's on the bottom there. He was the radio repairman, and I helped him. I used to put antennas up in 1928 with, for bright stars. And uh, uh, so that, that, that's how I got involved, trying to find some photos. I've got, for the last seven years, I've had a warehouse, actually it's, it's an old apartment I'm paying rent on, with all this old history that I promised everybody I would get together one day. I haven't got to it, I'm starting to dig through. I found this one photograph, there's a couple there, of a photograph of um, taken inside the storeroom of the crowd outside watching television. <laughs> so I, I have that, and plus the fact that uh, it generated uh, national and international interest in late 19, uh, uh, late uh, in uh, 19, uh, yeah, 50, 1950, and in early 1951, some radio fellows here might remember Radio News, the Radio News Magazine. They came through Felco, and there's a lot of misinformation in there because they said Philco developed this, it was Gerald. But it was a Philco public relations fellow. 15 pages come down and took photographs through the whole thing. That generated information. That did because it, radio news went around the world. It's a monthly magazine. Who's magazine? I forget who published it. But it, you remember radio news, George? You're talking about this article, Bob. Um, <laughs> Well. Oh <laughs> yes, this is this is it. <laughs> this is it. What a coincidence! But anyway, they uh, they took. There's actually photographs in there. Then the uh, Cable um, Society published the whole thing back some years ago, and I don't. I can't find any copies of that magazine. But it's in the Cable Society, and I've got to call Denver sometime. They must have. Have that. Well, I have it in, 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 in Exeter, I'm sure, to uh, duplicate that. But that magazine generated tremendous interest because it showed how I built the amplifiers, how I built the fabricated the cases, power. It's a complete description on, quote, how to build a cable system. So that, that all generated tremendous interest. That was in early 1950. Was in Jim Grouts, do you remember when well, uh, cable came to town? It, yeah, well, Newsweek. In came in 19 this yeah. was in. Um, this wasn't Newsweek, but this yeah, is. Yeah, but this is one. But it was uh, Radio News, uh, a, 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 a magazine that you'd pick up at a newsstand. But the television, the radio men at the time all got the radio news. Uh, you possibly remember it, Joe. Yeah, and that big thick volume. And that generated that interest all over the country. And I got lots of telephone calls, letters, and everything else as about, send me this information, that information. But that, 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 that answers that. Well, Al Warren was <coughs> writing a good bit about you in yeah, TV. in the early days. Too. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. in the late 50s, in late 1950, because yeah. I was reading about it. Yeah. And he kept on writing because you were news. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, he kept on writing uh, in through 1951, and then stopped writing about you and started writing about the industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've talked with Al about this, but you're a real newsmaker and sold yeah. a lot of copy for him there. But Jim, this, can can you? I want to get Jim to tell about uh, cable coming to Meadville. Yeah, but, uh, I, I'd like to start back with what John says that we had, we ought to, we ought to talk a little bit about how it was to really get things started because everybody experiences the same problem and and you're talking about the 
ice shooting the ice, I did the same thing <laughs> with Channel 2. We had built, in, in Atlanta, you remember Jack Beavers? He, he built all the antennas from Gerald. Jack Beaver, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, he designed the Channel 2 antenna for us. We had problems with co-channel, and, and I'd like to also explain what co-channel is a little bit. It's two channels hitting an antenna at the same time, and we were trying to bring in Channel 2 Pittsburgh, which was 90 miles away, but Channel 2 Buffalo was 90 miles away. So we had to build that antenna with a big screen on it. It was just a dipole, the, a single dipole, but we put two of stacked two of them. But anyway, we built a chicken screen in the back to shield it, and that screen got full of ice, just coated with ice. And I didn't, I didn't know what kind of shot, but I wanted a small shot, so I didn't want to blow the antenna away. <laughs> and that's what happened. We I just went up with a shotgun and start shooting the ice off of the back of the antennas on, on the screen. And all of a sudden, the picture came in good. Came in good. And that worked. But, and that's why I say that we all had pretty much the same kind of a problem. And we would think nothing of tick pick the phone up and I'd call Joe or I'd call John. I'd have this problem and, oh, sure, we did that. Yeah. And work it out. And, and that's what I think was very unique about the cable industry and the people in it was that they, we were all friends. We all knew each other personally. We all helped. And didn't hesitate to ever call, and and none of them would not take the call except John. Sometimes wouldn't he think it was a bill collector? <laughs> <laughs> well, John had to serve up the hot dogs in between the calls. <laughs> Uh, but, not, only, not only that, but I think I had the reputation from not paying my bills in a timely fashion. <laughs> oh, no, no. You wouldn't do something like that. <laughs> we all had problems paying our bills. Well, that's but, you know, not... I'd like to hear Jim's story about you, you told last year Christmas and how hard, because I think it's reflective of how hard we work to try to keep the systems going, about provide the service. About the coffee? Yeah, yeah. give him that story. We, we, we were, this was... See, I'd like to go back and start and say how we went three channel, five channel, twelve. Channel. But anyway, we were building the, I guess, twenty channel system then, and it was aluminum, all aluminum cable, and and the fittings. Here again, experimenting with everything we did. Uh, it was one Christmas Eve, the fitting pulled apart, and we lost a lot of pictures, and. Christmas Day, we had to go out and work. We had to, all the crews out working, trying to get this stuff put back together. And in Meadville, you, trying to find a cup of coffee on Christmas Day in Meadville was pretty tough. And I didn't have time to go make it. But I, I thought I, I'll, I'll get them a sandwich and keep them going. But instead of coffee, I had got into making some wine at one time. <laughs> and my wine looked like black coffee. <laughs> So I filled the thermos bottle with wine, and I took it out and, and started pouring the wine in paper cups. And everybody would grab the cup and start thinking it was a hot cup of coffee. And as soon as it was wine, they downed it. <laughs> so it helped. We got the problems corrected. And it, it was pretty funny. But, but that's, those, were, they were, those weren't unusual things. We did a lot of things like that. And you know, I you think, talk about the first picture. Is uh, when we. Uh, first put the system in Hazelden and right down off the heights, well, actually a second amplifier, you yeah. know. We turned it on, the pictures were good and everybody's happy and this and that. All of a sudden, the mayor of the town calls us up in council. He said, what, what are you people doing to the television on the heights? And I said, I don't know, what, what's wrong? He said, and he gave us numbers, he said, we ruined all the reception on, on, the, on the antenna services. And uh, sure enough, I go up the heights there, and they weren't getting really good reception, but they were getting some reception. And here, the cable was leaking. The line between the amplifier and the ADO box, it was leaking. So, Gerald sends up an engineer. He's there, boy, he, all week he's writing. I figured, oh boy, this guy knows this stuff. He's gonna fix this. Comes Friday, he said, yep, you got radiation, gets in his car and drives away. So, <laughs> Talking about that problem, Joe, that was one of the reasons the FCC got hot under the collar. Yep. One of the perfect examples of that occurred in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, when a U.S. Air, well, it wasn't U.S. Air in those days, it was Allegheny Airlines. Mm -hmm. The flight coming into Harrisburg Airport 
lost total communication with the ground. And when they finally solved this particular problem, it was because the, the uh, AGC channel on the Gerald amplifiers in Harrisburg leaked and blocked out the ability of the, the airplane to receive signals from the tower. And I spent a full week in Harrisburg that year repairing every amplifier by moving the AGC frequency to a frequency which would not interfere <laughs> with the Harrisburg Airport. Well, the way we fix it, though, is uh, Tony Katona came up. And what we did, we disconnected, started disconnecting cables. We had a guy in the house still looking at, at the pictures. Because actually, we put a big black bar oh, about three quarters of, across the picture. Was, the cable was leaking. And here we found was a cable, like I mentioned, between the ADO box and, and the amplifier. And what Tony did, he, we took a piece of a telephone line, the lead line, we pulled the copper wires out, and we put the RG-59 in there and put the connectors on and stopped it. But this is the cooperation we had with Gerald and different operators and so forth. I have and a radiation story, I just thought of it right yeah. now. When, when we were building this, remember the you got one of these boxes? Yeah. You had to put the amplifiers in the boxes, put the boxes on the pole. We were building the system in the southern part, in the lower part of Meadville. And as usual, when you start putting cable up and boxes on the pole, people think you're interfering with their signal mm -hmm. from their antennas. So we had the boxes up and the cable in, and we got a report that the FCC was coming down to do a, do a radiation check from Buffalo. And they brought these big trucks down with millions of dollars of equipment, and they started doing the radiation checks around this area. And they came back zero radiation. And what they didn't know is they didn't go up and look in the boxes, they were empty. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a very excellent report on radiation. <laughs> There were a lot of engineers that couldn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> they never went up the pole to look, open the box to look in it. They knew there was radiation there, but they just couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, those were those were all a lot of a lot of interesting problems, and, and and there were times when when the people from Gerald would come and we'd end up going to the antenna site to work out a problem. Next thing you know, it's breakfast time. You just work all night. You never stop until the problem was corrected. And, and, and I think that was kind of unique with, with the people in our industry back then. I think it was just a, a love that John talks about that he wanted to see the results of trying to make that picture come down that line. And, 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 and I felt the same way. I, I, I remember the first time I saw a picture off of the satellite. And, and I, what a thrill that was. And, and, those are the kind of things that never want to make you quit. You can't, you're afraid you're going to miss something if you quit. And, and, and it's, it's a lot more sophisticated now. I think, I think when, we, when we first started, almost everything that we did was, was experimental. You, you got equipment from the manufacturer. You knew what it was supposed to do, but rarely did it do it. I think today you pretty much know when you, whatever you get, it's going to work. And, and sure. I think those experimental things were very good to us. What kind of a work week did you work? <laughs> oh, around the clock. <laughs> there was no, if the TV is off, I mean, you don't go home because that telephone will drive you nuts, whether it's Saturday, Sunday, midnight, Christmas, Easter, or whatever. Those pictures were life and death. They'd murder you if they didn't. They have to have no pictures. You're in big trouble. And you just kept working until you got pictures of that phone would drive you completely out of your mind. It never stopped ringing. Our customers would get irate. They're missing their news. They're missing their favorite program. My kid wants to watch Hatchie Malachi. Why is it off? Or my afternoon program don't. <laughs> oh, well, Irene, Joe would come in the door and say, well, "I've fixed these," and you'd hand him another batch. Is that the way? <laughs> Hatchie Malachi. <laughs> yeah. Did customers get like that right away? Or as soon as they had cable, they immediately got hooked on it and they oh, yes. got mad if it wasn't well, Absolutely. Oh yeah. yeah. They loved cable. They still do. I don't know what you do without cable. That's that's again as an engineer. Again, as an engineer rather than an operator, I didn't have to worry about PR. So in my particular community, the first system I built, everybody called me Mr. Television. 
And uh, I would go from the office to the top of the mountain for some reason. I'd get stopped half the way up and somebody would jump out and say, hey, the cable went off last night at eight o'clock and I waited until two o'clock in the morning, still didn't come back on again. What are you gonna do about it? I suggested to them that maybe they ought to write a letter to the FCC and if they didn't want to do that, why don't you go get your television from somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> You're rough. <laughs> you know, hey, there's, there's, I'm not the system operator. I'm the engineer. <laughs> there's some difference between cable television today and the first day that Bob turned it on. There's just more channels, there's fewer interruptions, and there's better picture quality. It's just an evolutionary problem. How many channels did you have when you first turned it on? One. Three. We had three. Yeah, I, w I didn't have that luxury. Where was your system? <laughs> do, do you want me to do my spiel on it now? I mean, yeah, uh, go ahead. we'll bounce to this end. Uh, One channel? Yeah, actually, uh, I've got to go back a little bit beyond that because I cheated a little bit on the industry. Uh, I uh, actually was a ham radio operator, amateur radio operator to most people and operated W2DBR. I lived up in the Finger Lakes region in New York State. Worked for a, uh, an outfit called Sylvania Electric Products Corporation and we built picture tubes there for the television sets. And uh, as a sideline, uh, I built mini CATV systems. I didn't know that's what they were at the time, but the dealers in town, in Geneva, Waterloo, Seneca Falls, the whole area, uh, we were about 35, 40 miles away from Syracuse, which was our main uh, television area. You could get some signals from Rochester, but they weren't very good. And when they would sell a television set, the deal was if I get pictures, I'll buy the set. If I don't get pictures, take it back. So whenever they put their regular antennas up and didn't get pictures, I cut a deal with them, I'll provide the pictures. So we took what we call were the tough nuts. And I started that in early 1949, but I don't claim to be uh, uh, the first in cable television because it wasn't that. But it was, it was a mini cable television system geared to that one set. We either used high antennas or antennas that were not located on the property. And of course, uh, being a ham operator, well, I was very used to the balanced transmission line. That's what they call railroad tracks uh, when the cable uh, system uses it. And in fact, you don't use railroad tracks anymore, but West Virginia was paved with railroad tracks for a lot of years because that's the only way they could get signal around to the various homes. Uh, but we used railroad tracks. Uh, we uh, did everything. George, you so better explain what that means. They might think you're a real railroad track. Yeah, well, it was open wire transmission line, a balanced transmission line as compared with coaxial cable, which is an unbalanced transmission line. It's but, little spacers that made it look like railroad. Is this what they call the yeah, G-line? The yeah, no, no, this is even different than G-line. That's a surface wave, which you know we haven't touched on here, but I, I <coughs> sold a good bit of that, too. Uh, but the, the problems we had back then were if you had a water tank or if you had anything that a house was behind and they couldn't get signal direct from the station, you had to devise some way to do it. That's what the cable system does today. But going from that where we took those tough problems that were in the uh, area where the television signal actually was located and then moving it out further where there was no television signal and you had to go up on a mountain or something to find it. Uh, I finally got interested in what Al Warren was writing about Bob Tarleton and in early 1951 started to build my first system. We turned it on in December of 1951 and we had one channel. That's the only one I could find in the area. and. Uh, it was difficult to get people interested in one channel, especially when the fact that I had a signal at the antenna terminals of 100 microvolts, which as anyone that's been in the business for a while knows was probably not enough to make uh, a good picture. But you could see people moving, uh, shall we say, on the television set and you could hear it. And uh, it wasn't a 
quality signal so that people would really come like some of these gentlemen have said and really knock your door down to uh, want to buy it. Uh, I had to do a little bit of educating to people and it took me about six months before I could get the dealers in town to actually stock television sets. And I did that by stocking them myself and saying, if you won't sell the television sets, then I will. What did you charge for one channel? Uh, it was a $145 installation fee. I just checked that in my reference material here. And we charge $3.50 a month. You ask why $3.50? Why $1.145? Well, I think that's what Bob was charging, and I just copied him. Is that about it? And we, I go, we, we charge the same price for three channels. They got a better deal from us. You're exactly <laughs> right. I would have charged more if I could, because it was a little difficult to sell. But I asked Bob one time, why did you charge $3.50? Or was it $3 or $3.50? I started four? with $3. Everybody, $3. everybody else that came in would say, I'm going to charge a little $3.50, and they finally moved up to 4 and $5. We were still, and I was stuck with three dollars. I was afraid to raise it anymore because of the customers. And finally, my board says, "Bob, you're starting to get tight in here. You better get your rates raised." So that that's what prompted. But I asked you one time why you started with three dollars, and what? you said that's what the telephone company charged. I think that was what Did the I telephone say that? company. Yeah, well, that's what you told me. The telephone it was company kind of an arbitrary. As a matter of fact, I must confess, I think I checked in Philadelphia what the um, apartment houses were charging. They were charging a rental also. And it was somewhere about one and a half or two or three dollars a month for this. And and the three dollars is what I arbitrarily, it was an arbitrary figure. And the installation was a hundred dollars. But nobody else went a hundred dollars at all. We're gonna get more. And they all did get more, but I charged a hundred dollars. Until a couple of years later, we went and disbanded that rate. We went to a higher rate and only charged a minimal installation fee. Yeah, go ahead. I, How many channels did they get for three dollars? Uh, in the beginning, it was only two channels. Soon, channel ten in Philadelphia came on three channels, and then about a year later, um, when I changed the antenna site, a better site on the other side of Summit Hill, and didn't go through Summit Hill, still battling with them. As a matter of fact, I, I built a complete telephone, a complete line, and. Um, we, um, we then had uh, five channels out of New York. Joe, you charged how much for three channels? 375. And the hookup charge was how much? 100 and a quarter. Uh, I, should, I should explain, whenever I was building for the capital group in Williamsport, <laughs> Glenn was across the river, across the creek, building on, was it West Williamsport? West, West, South Williamsport. South Williamsport building a system there. So we were in, in competition, but I was so interested. I didn't even know what he was doing. I was so busy trying to get this thing in order. And, um, but uh, later on I knew Eric because then he came with Gerald. Well, I think that uh, Williamsport probably maybe still has the highest pole plant in the, the country because every one that wanted to build another system just replaced all the poles and they kept going higher and higher. Mm -hmm. I seem to recall there were four cable systems operating at one time in Williamsport. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. When they were one of the things that nobody had mentioned with regards, we talked about getting on the poles, there's something called the National Safety Code, which determines uh, what you can do on a pole. And the positions on a pole are specifically spelled out with regards to the voltage being carried by the power company and the telephone companies as well. And we would always have to get between <coughs> the telephone company and power, and you had to be at least 40 inches away from power if it was not primary power, and a foot above the, the uh, telephone company. And frequently, we had to pay the telephone company, or the power company, because the telephone company would never let us on their poles. We would have to pay the power company to change the pole to make room enough for us to get on many areas. I want to find out from Jim and John what they charged and how many <coughs> channels they uh, had in the beginning. $125, $350 a month for three channels. Uh, we um, charged $150 to connect and $295 uh, for two snowy channels. <laughs> and, um, and when I reflect on one of the reasons that I remember Milt Shap came up 
and suggested that we charge $150 because there was that question that we weren't going to be around too long. That's right. Yeah. And we had to get our money up front. And as I look at how we, how th we went from $150 and we were really not getting the customers on, so we dropped it down to 135 and when we started our second system, we started at 125 and that didn't do it. We went to $75, and we went to $37.50 eventually, and some years later, in the mid-60s, there was still on, you know, we were still searching for customers and competing with the antennas and trying to get people to come on. It wasn't as if they were all chasing us to get on. We were trying to get customers on. And eventually, um, we went to uh, hooking them up for free. And, and on Thanksgiving, I'd give a turkey away. And whatever it took. But I think back that the best promotion we ever had was when we decided to pay a potential customer to give them $37.50 for their antenna. And once we got that antenna off that roof, we were in good shape. That was a great promotion. I'd like to add something to that, too, because I notice now, John, that they're buying dishes back. That's correct. And I had a and big we discussion. We did the same thing. We had tons of antennas. i just like to comment a little bit because, you know, times have changed, but we forget. I was talking to our marketing people not too long ago, and our competitor is, you know, the dish people, the direct the satellite people. And, um, you know, I said, well, you know, uh, uh, what are we doing to, uh, to get back some of those customers we've lost? And, you know, the usual thing, the mailers and, and service and all that sort of thing. Well, I, I said, did you ever think about uh, buying the dishes back? <laughs> and, uh, oh, we can't afford that. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. And I said, my God, we couldn't afford $37.50. And now we are offering $100, some cases $200, to get them back, and it's, and it's working. What do you do with all those dishes that you <laughs> buy back, John? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> what, the dishes or the antennas? No, no, the dishes. Oh, the you dishes. Can't, you can't resell them because then you lose the customers. <coughs> well, I remember. Even for the cable museum. <laughs> Is that where they are, huh? I remember the antennas we bought back ended up in Florida being sold as antennas again. They moved them down there. Well, it's, we had to reinvent the wheel uh, to buy back dishes, apparently, but it's, it's a great sales gimmick. I'd like to make one more comment about the beginning of it. When, when we started with three channels in Meadville, everything that we've ever done since never created as much excitement as we did with the three channels. We added five, and it was exciting, but after that, television became old hat. But when they had nothing, and we brought three channels in, that was big excitement. And, and all the other stuff that happened after that <coughs> seemed to just be accepted. And going back to what you said, Irene, about when you add channels, you have to add, increase the prices. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we get into a, every time you pick up an article now in the newspaper that the cable overcharges. But we were charging more than a dollar a channel when we first started. <laughs> and, and now you, it's a lot less money than that. But we have, you're buying channels now. You're, it's, it's a whole new picture now. But you must remember in the early days. about the 350 a month. You have to remember that in the early days there was a threat to the cable systems that when the freeze was lifted by the FCC, there'd be no need to have cable. And that feel was very rampant in Gerald, which was the major manufacturer of cable equipment at that particular time. And in fact, the president of that outfit, Milton Gerald Schapp, decided that, hey, he wasn't going to be in the cable industry after the freeze came off. And so he bought uh, Carmen, Harmon Carden, uh, who made uh, hi-fi equipment. We bought uh, 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 a radio manufacturer. We bought an equipment manufacturer. We made our own zinc die casting. We did our own plastic die casting. And that lasted for about two years. And they all disappeared and we went back into the cable industry. At what point did you all feel like you were out of the woods and you, your company was no longer in danger and that cable was really going to survive? When you could pay your bills. <laughs> when was that? 
Well, it depended. Uh, some systems started to pay their bills sooner than others. But I can remember uh, some of the systems that uh, I had uh, a problem getting the financing for, shall we say, and the interest rate was a little bit too <coughs> high, and it took a much longer payout for those, and I wondered about even bothering with them. But when you're trying to sell two or three channels, uh, you've got a difficult time convincing a large portion of the eligible subscribers to actually pay you a bill. Remember, the penetration that the cable <coughs> industry started to enjoy in the 70s of anywhere from 60 to 90 percent uh, was not something that you had back in the 1950s. Uh, people didn't have the money for the television set, and if they didn't have a television set, they didn't want cable. So you had very low penetrations back at that time. Addressing uh, your question, uh, my experience would be that um, uh, that that was only for the first couple of years. And as this looked as though it was something that could supply a utility purpose, that disappeared from cable operators. The cable operators were enthused, they were growing and building. So um, uh, there may have been uh, other financial people that uh, felt, well, this is only a hedge. But my experience had been that that, that disappeared over a period of, of a, just a few, the first few years. Well, at least we were going to get television. There's going to be more cable. There's going to be more television signals. And may I just make a comment? And thank you, George. I want to see you about this. Yeah. I knew I had this some one of this. Newsweek, 1951, January 15th. Newsweek describes the sensational new community antenna system. And it's all about the Lansford system. Starts out to huddle be, be, behind the hills, surrounded Panther Valley. Televiewing viewing in Panther Valley. That was in 1951 as a result of the publicity in 1950 that, that Well, you uh, mentioned, spent. George mentioned penetration in, uh, like we built the early 50s, and then in the 60s, 65, 66, we hit 70% penetration. And when you hit 70%, why, we were at, well, she, she paid the bills, but uh, we were able to pay the bills and uh, mm -hmm. update this, uh, the system, we increased our rates a little bit, but penetration was a number. Yes, well, at, uh, in the 60s and 70s, it started to climb up, but in the 50s, I don't imagine well, any system had over 25, 30% penetration. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that was a <coughs> system that was really going good because most people didn't have the television sets. And then you had to screw up with the color sets. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was difficult to really convince people to lay out the money for a color television set and lay out the money you needed for the cable too. So they, they found other things to spend their money on. Yeah, but every time you oh, wanted to upgrade yeah. and you had to refinance, that wasn't exactly an easy thing. Matter of fact, there were only a few banks in the country that actually gave out a true cable TV financing. You know, there was one bank in Pittsburgh that had, had only given out one or two loans, Pittsburgh National <laughs> Bank. I think there was one one or two lo uh, banks in Philadelphia. But I don't think. One or two in New York City. There weren't any in Chicago or Atlanta, Dallas, Houston. There was one or two on the West Coast, and that was it. Economy Finance in Indianapolis That's right. did a land office business, Especially with, you yeah. paid for it. Yeah, five over prime. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of ingenuity in the, in the pricing uh, in those days. And one, one instance that I think about uh, frequently because it was so unusual, and I believe it was Pottsville, Pennsylvania. I think Marty Malarkey told me this story. But... Uh, uh, in that depressed town to get enough money together to buy the television set, which was four or five hundred dollars, and then pay a hundred and fifty dollars on top of it for a connection wasn't an easy thing to do. Yet people were just begging to get on in some fashion or another. And Marty went, if it was Pottsville, Marty went to the bank and said, I want to make a deal with you. 
I want you to agree to land uh, to anybody who comes and asks you that wants it to buy a television set and a connection. Lend them the necessary money to do it, and I will guarantee the loan. And they started to do that, and I don't remember specifically the number of people who took advantage of it, but it was a large number. And yes, it was malarkey because he told me later, he said, I didn't lose any money on that deal at all. No, these were called recourse loans. Yeah. And uh, you could lump your installation price and the television set in along with it. The bank would discount it. And if the customer didn't pay, then you had to then repossess. You paid, yes. you, it was a recourse loan. And we started that in early 1952. Uh, the bank was very much interested in this because they had our guarantee, you might say. And yet, as you say, it was the only way you could sell the package. The people didn't have the money to do it, and there was no other way for them to do it. So we set it up on a time payment plan. Yeah. Brian, can I comment on one thing? Because I don't know how much longer we've got, but, you know, uh, we touched on a lot of... Uh, interesting things uh, that occurred in the early days and uh, one is certainly the um, the issues we had with AT&T and I, and I think we have a sense of that and the broadcasters and um, we um, one thing that we haven't touched upon that has always been troubling to me and that is in the 60s when there seemed to be um, a future in cable television because of microwave uh, and uh, as you went to search for franchises and you look for the communities with six feet antennas or ten foot antennas and you looked as a good prospect they began to have a little competition between who would get the franchises in the community and as a result the municipalities began to um, dictate what would be in those franchises. And one of the most horrendous, most difficult moments, in, in my opinion, in my lifetime in cable is, and I, with no offense to any community, but they began to regulate our rates. And you talk about hat in hand and humility as you would approach a community, you know, and you would add channels and rebuild your system. And you would go in and ask, at the time we might be getting $6 a month, and we'd ask for a quarter more. We couldn't get it. And that was a terrible position to be in. And thank God, when the cable began de deregulated and pretty much in 82, we started to go down that road and we started to have the money centers be really interested in building their urban areas and suburbia, and satellite was in play. It's a different world. And then we got regulated again in 92. It was a very dark day. And now we have competition, and I hope I never see the day when I have that situation where regulates, or rates are regulated. And every time you do that, you stymie an industry and growth and vision and entrepreneurship. John, the comments you made about microwave is very true because that opened up a whole new aspect for cable. One of the largest cable operators in the business, TCI, actually came out of, out of uh, mid-mountain uh, microwave. That was their beginning of, of TCI. And the, the whole East Coast, up and down the East Coast, got into the microwave business from Atlantic City on up and down with an outfit called Prism. And that was all microwave. And that really opened up the industry to more and more channels that were desirable channels, not duplicates of the channels that were already on there. So microwave had a big impact on cable. Warren Fribley uh, certainly did a good job with, what, pen, pen microwave, pen, pen service microwave. Like Yeah, uh, in lower New York State. He was in Horseheads, New York. Horseheads, yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. We'll, from Corning, New York. We only have a couple minutes left, and I want to get each of you to, to talk a little bit about some of the people, just a couple of the names of people who, who helped you out and uh, helped you get through all the, the 
problems you had to get through and uh, are not at this table today or who are no longer with us and whose names should be mentioned. Uh, George, you want to start? I have to think about that. Uh, someone that helped you that's not at the table? Who do you think his name should, uh, we should not conclude this discussion without talking about? Oh, okay. Uh, the fellow that helped me most was a gentleman named Frank Dilker, and he operated Schuylkill Electric Distributors in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. You probably remember Frank. Uh, he carried me on his tab when I was bankrupt and didn't know it until I could start to pay the bill. And whenever I would run out of supplies, I'd get down and uh, Frank would give me uh, another reel of RG-59 or some other equipment he might have. And uh, I'd give him a check and say, hold it till next week. Then I'd use that wire and go out and make another connection. Then I could make the payment to him. So Frank really carried me. And uh, I think I owe uh, my being able to still be in the cable business or at least as many years as I did to Frank. Up. A couple of months ago, I <coughs> went to my dentist in State College, and he mentioned that Jim Palmer, who had hired me, was in the day before and mentioned that uh, he had pro probably six months to live. He had cancer. And so I went home and wrote Jim a, a real fine letter because he hired me in spite of the fact that I had absolutely no experience whatsoever in communications. He didn't want anybody with experience. I guess he, he didn't want to retrain anybody. Uh, Everybody around this table knows that Jim was a very unique guy in, in many ways. But he hired me and gave me the opportunity. Uh, and I've, you know, been very, very fortunate. It's been a wonderful ride. And uh, I certainly uh, am beholden to him. And not only did he hire me, but when we left, and all these franchises that I got were for Jim, you know, in, in Center Video. And when we left the former owned company, Jim, on two occasions, loaned us $5 million that we didn't have to serve for two years. And so, really, I, uh, I am indebted to him and, and hope that really there's some mistake and somehow or other he can stay with us a lot longer than the six months. Bob Charlton? Uh, I had, uh, I admit, many a person that I respected and helped me. Uh, I have mentioned some of them before. They were principals of the power company, and even the Pennsylvania Light Company, a division vice president that uh, was very helpful. Uh, they had a had a selfish motive. They wanted to get television, but uh, notwithstanding, they gave me tremendous help. Local bank, I had no credit, uh, no reasonable credit, and uh, one of their directors at that time was the chairman of the of the um, Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, Tommy John Evans. And uh, I saw him, he says, Bob, that's no problem. You go in and talk to the cashier and uh, I'll assure you you get past. He was chairman of the board. Uh, these are all persons who, I, without their insistence, without their help, without their friendship, uh, I think I would have had a problem. I owe my father. Uh, he kept paying my little salary, but it was still a salary. Whenever I wasn't really tending to the work, I was doing experimenting. I owe him uh, a lot and my mother. But um, uh, I, I, these are persons that, um, uh, personal persons that really helped me get started. It took me a year, year and a half to get over the hump. And uh, uh, I can't think of any but he else at the present time that I indebted to, but thank you. Irene? Well, my sister and her husband had loaned us $5,000, and that's how we got started in cable TV. So I speak for them. Joe? I agree with her, and then I must give a lot of credit to George Barco, because we had different problems and this and that, and you talk to him, and there was a way to solve it. And, uh, and another one would be Jim Peters from the 
uh, first uh, Chicago National Bank. He gave me my first big loan, which I was able to buy the Northeast Cable. But George Barco, Yolanda, I remember that we had trouble in New York and uh, New Jersey that we were building the systems. He came down there and we, we fixed it. He knew how to do it. And so he was quite a man, really good. What? Well, there's one name that I'm sure has affected everybody at this table. And that's the ex, <clears throat> the ex governor of Pennsylvania, Milton Schaap. And uh, he was my guy. I worked for him. He's the greatest boss I ever had. And uh, I'm not so sure that this table would exist if it wasn't for him. Because in reality, Milt literally created the equipment which got this whole industry started. Strat? Every operator who's sitting at this table is included among those that helped me get my start. Uh, they were all pioneers <coughs> in the state. Uh, two others to be mentioned. Let <coughs> Len just mentioned Milton Schaap. The other was Martin F. Malarkey, uh, who organized the National Community Television Association and arranged to get me hired as general counsel for $200 a month. <laughs> Jim? I guess I have to mention George Barco. Oh, well, the Barcos he, too. He was, on, yeah. I mean, he was my boss. <laughs> and Yolanda also helped me a, a great deal. And then, of course, Helene was my right hand. John, you get the last word. Well, you know, this is a very um, sensitive and is, you know, um, sometime if we ever have another period in our lives where we can gather i just like to focus on people and personalities because there's so many things that we didn't cover and i'd like to um, acknowledge and pay respect because along the way when you take this journey there's so many people that touch our lives and mean so much and it's not fair to signal so but I will say this, you know, yes, on a general basis, you know, my brother Gus, that was my partner and supporting for many years, and certainly my sons now that have carried on the business and done an, a wonderful job. But if I'm going to focus in on the people that have no longer amongst us and deceased, I think it'd be a little safer grounds. And so... The one's names I would mention would be Milt Schaap because he was truly our general for many years, uh, led the way, we believed in him, and he did vendor financing and everything else that went along with it. Then a name that wouldn't mean much to hardly anybody in this country, we will never make the headlines, was Joe Conwell that would come calling on us month after month and try to solve our problems and give us that extra equipment. Just a salesman that represented Gerald, but I tell you, he was a blessing when he came around because we had so many problems. And that doesn't mean that all the Gerald team and everything else that, but that was special. And then I think of John Walson, who uh, when I was depressed and down and out and discouraged, John Walson would be there and always tell me why there was a future in cable television and why he believed in it and how passionate he was. And by the way, if you want to sell it, your system, I'll buy it. And that was encouraging and reassuring. And you know, in the Barcos, because how hard they fought with so much integrity and, and believed in a cause and believed what was right and just, justice, they fought so hard for this industry. And I have to think of Irving Kahn, who was a wonderful visionary that took this industry and to places we never thought of. And lastly, I have to think of Bill Daniels, who, the godfather of this industry, introduced so many different ways to do things in this industry and took risks. Some were good and some were bad, but he was always a leader and the tallest tree in a forest in my admission. And so 
those little notes that Bill would write me and the phone calls he would get to encourage me. And then I would read the headlines where he started a brokerage firm, where he sold a system. All that led to um, great support. So I can't, you know, and people that are still living, I, I don't want to, you know, the Ted Turners and, her, and uh, John Malone's and Amos Huss. I could go on and on, and I wish I had time to give them all credit. God bless them. All the little bankers, all the big investors, all the people that made this industry what it is. Can't thank them enough. I think we'll end on that note. I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. We'll have to do this again. My pleasure. Okay.